Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. Okay, welcome back again to this week and to my second annual holiday episode. Um, I did this last year on a whim when I one of my guests was a specialist in dealing with narcissistic families and dynamics, and uh, and we decided that you know, gosh, the holiday season can be really out of control for a lot of families, especially if you have like a narcissistic mother or mother-in-law. And so she and I recorded this episode, um, a holiday version of the episode, and it felt really good. Like it felt like it had a lot of um, really good reasoning for it. And so I have with me a repeat guest that many of you guys have already listened to on a couple of episodes. Um, and she's like the best fit for this. Um, the first time she and I talked to each other, we talked about cutting ties with toxic family members because sometimes that is the best decision to be able to do for yourself. And then she came back on and we talked about divorce and how to master your divorce. And so naturally she's got a lot of experience in counseling families and individuals with having difficulties with, um, you know, certain people in their sphere. And the holidays are pretty crazy because there's a lot of emotions that come around with holidays and they tend to take whatever family crazy you already have going on and they throw gasoline on it when it comes to whatever the holiday is. So welcome back to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. All right. Now, by the time that most of you are listening to this episode and it's actually published, which is going to be around Thanksgiving time, um, some of you may already be stuck in your holiday plans and you can't back out of everything, but maybe not. And so what I want to be able to tackle today are some of those major conflicts that people do have with uh, families um, when it comes specifically to the holiday gatherings. We already know that some of us have conflicts year round regardless. And I feel like in my experience that they tend to be around, you know, a few core areas. One is uh, how do you deal with people that you've spent all year avoiding? Um, children, especially when it comes to children that are in separated families, and then religion. And since the holidays tend to be obviously centered around religious and religious activities. And so, Elizabeth, before we, we jump into those three areas, um, say, help explain, how does somebody decide to say yes or no to seeing family over the holidays? I mean, what kinds of things should they think about in terms of, you know, what could be good for them and good for their family? Yeah. Well, it's such an important question um, and such an important topic. I'm so glad you're covering it on One Broken Mom. Um, I, I was thinking about what you said about how this is coming out around Thanksgiving, and we probably could have done this in June, because actually the key really of dealing with toxic family members is giving yourself time and space to figure out what feels best for you. And so actually we probably spend about six months either worrying about, oh shit, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up or Christmas is coming up, the Holy Trinity, New Year's. Um, So what if we actually started, maybe even after the last holiday, we start thinking about what I want to do differently the next year. So anytime we are thinking about seeing family members that cause us to be out of sorts or not our best selves, we really need to ask ourselves, what do I have to sacrifice to make this dinner or this event work? And is it worth it for me? Yeah. And I feel like there's always going to be acrimony at a gathering. I mean, it, you know, yeah. when you get a bunch of people together and everybody's nervous systems together, um, you're going right. to have some sort of it, but there is, there does seem to be like this, you know, it's a re, you know, car turn rev limit on just how far you really want to go with that. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and I guess the other thing too is, um, it's going to be also if your family is more than just you, but it's a spouse and it's children, it's, you know, mm-hmm. you might be able to tolerate it. And especially for some of us that grew up in families where we learned to tolerate everybody's, you know, craziness and shenanigans, yeah. um, that doesn't necessarily mean like your spouse might be totally, you know, geared up. Right. Right. Absolutely. And it might also be really crappy for your relationship. Mm-hmm. Right, just be some of these survival techniques. I'm glad you brought this up that we've learned when we're used to being in a toxic family of pushing through, not noticing how someone's being attacking of us, um, laughing off really mean behavior. Like, that's not good to expose to our kids or good for our partnerships. 
So very often I've worked with people who will go to a situation where they know it's going to be terrible. They're dreading it. And they come back with what I like to call an emotional hangover. They've had a huge fight on the way home with their partner. They've screamed at their kid. They forgot a work deadline. Sometimes, I don't know if you've had this experience, but people get sick, like actually physically sick after one of these incidences because their nervous system has been so on guard, so tightly wound and also pushing away, you know, really these feelings of, no, this is not okay, that they just crash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I thought about something too here, and that is when you have to kind of think about what your boundaries might be before you say yes or no, right? And yeah. whether or not it feels comfortable um, or, you know, how would you bring it up? Like, you know, I, I think about maybe it's somebody that, or, or a situation, let's say, listen, yeah. we'll come, but we don't want any of this to happen you know, and in the right family, you can set a boundary. And then this, and then in the wrong family, when you set a boundary, you get made fun of for having boundaries, you know, because you're the person who goes to therapy and everybody else is fine kind of a thing. Exactly. Um, so mm -hmm. if you're deciding yes or no, and you're, you're coming up, you know, how do you, how do you uh, propose or suggest that somebody in a family maybe to go together and decide what are our boundaries that are willing to accept? And, you know, feels like you start negotiating with whoever yes. the, the inviter is or whoever the family is that's trying to do the gathering, right? Yes. Well, the first part I will say is we have to humbly accept that we cannot change anybody. So no matter how many requirements we make of another person, um, they're probably not going to do it. There's the family members, you know, they know for years that you're allergic to peanuts and they always like put out the peanut brittle. You know, it's like they just, for whatever their issues are, they are not going to get it. So I would actually encourage you to turn inward as I usually do and think about what would make this right for you and what can you do if you've decided to go to make it comfortable for you. A client of mine told me her friend once gave her the one, two, three rule when you're visiting family. Every, for every hour that you see family, you spend two hours with your partner and three hours on your own. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? Right. Yeah. It's just brings to mind like the balance and how much more self-care you need. So I would say the boundaries are for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, showing up um, either for the beginning part of the dinner or just for dessert, right? Or knowing when you're going to leave, knowing that you're going to get a massage the next day. A huge one is do not stay under the same roof, please. Mm -hmm. Please get a camper, get a tent if you don't want to stay in a hotel. But being under the same roof of, of in a toxic family is so much more detrimental to your nervous system than anything because you go back into your old patterns from when you lived in that home and you are just bombarded all the time and all these beautiful boundaries that you set up for yourself. Trust me, I do it myself of my clients. They just... They fall away because it's like you're marinating in the sauce you've been in your whole life. It just, your boundaries can't stand up to it. They get drowned in it. Yeah. Yeah. I know despite my best intentions, a few times of being able to go visit family, I, I found like it's, it's an overwhelming process. And that's why, you know, I made my decision and we talked about this on the cutting ties. You know, I made my choice to just not even do any of that anymore. You know, I just said no completely because I, I felt like there wasn't a, there wasn't any time you know, or the amount of time I felt okay was, you know, minuscule compared to all the times I felt like I was just adjusting and, and moving and dodging and weaving and suppressing or blurting out or whatever it was. It was, yeah, falling right back into, you know, those old patterns. And it was just like, ugh, I just, you know, something that I couldn't do yeah, anymore. It just yeah. didn't work. And I just want to also name for this, for this episode, you know, kind of calling out the bullshit on the holidays, you know, that like if, you know, just because Thanksgiving is a holiday that, you know, basically consumerism has made it look like all families should be together or Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa, like that doesn't have to be your story. And sometimes I say to clients, like, don't try to put your square peg in a round hole. Like if you don't speak to your family by choice most, most of the year, why the hell would you spend Thanksgiving with them? Like, let's just live in a more consistent pace with what you, where you are. And there's so much pressure to kind of push away your feelings, suck it up for the holidays. And I, I don't think that's consistent with how people are during the rest of the year. So then you feel also very inauthentic and it doesn't work. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, and I'm so glad you brought that up because it definitely feels like the um, everybody's really, not everybody, that's a general statement, but that too many people feel that they have to do things because it's the cultural expectation. And there's a lot of questions, and those come from outside factors too and outside forces. What are you going to do for Thanksgiving? It's a question I was just yes. asked today. I'm probably going to do the exact same thing on that Thursday that I did the Thursday before and the Thursday after, <laughs> like, you know, but when you have that guilt of everybody around you also saying, what's your family holiday look like? And some of us have some difficulties, you know, actually saying, I'm, I don't have plans because I don't want to knowingly walk into a complete shit show. <laughs> so yes. I'm going to, I'm going to do nothing. And so people either feel obligated, right. To go visit family that they don't want to see, or they have a sense of shame of being able to, you know, speak openly about the fact that I'm rejecting all of that. I am rejecting this holiday idea that I need to do these things, you know, with people I don't want to spend time with. Right. And am I, who am I doing this for? I mean, in, in the United States, if you have a, a typical standard job, you have two days off. That means you have a four day weekend, which happens basically never. And how do you want to spend those four days? I mean, this is about you. You know, there's such a, there's so many shoulds. I hear them like circling around. Well, I should be with my family. I should visit my in-laws. We should split the time. We should do half and half. I mean, Make a weekend if you really want to see them. Pick a random weekend where maybe the flights are a little cheaper and go visit them. Well, then you say, well, I would never do that. Well, then why are you doing it now? <laughs> right, right. I think that's right. a good point for people to listen to is, uh, you know, and getting real with yourself and asking yourself that question, you know? Yeah, and you're totally right. You're going to have to deal with other people's responses, some shoulds and some shame. But I, I don't know about you, but I would much rather deal with that then have a terrible experience for myself for four days. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Um, and it can come from family too. Family can be really insidious. Um, that's a guilt tactic yes. that I've heard many times. It's like, but, but it's Christmas, you know, yeah. like, so? Right. <laughs> um, and then you pointed out earlier too that they can say, well, fine, I understand if you don't want to come, but we want to see the kids. Yes, right. And that's the next topic because when you have kids, yes. it's – even more levels on there because you do want your kids to have good experiences, right? Because they do love the holidays. Like there is this magical mythology and, and funness mm -hmm. that comes with it because they're seeing the same things out there. Their friends are celebrating Christmases with grandmas and there's all these iconic, you know, elements being thrown in our kids' direction. Yeah. And so you don't want your sourness and your, and your realism to dash them. Um, and so, you know, what kinds of things should we consider about with, you know, making sure our kids don't be, you know, don't end up traumatized by the holiday experience? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the most important thing for children is ritual, no matter what, however you do it. So it doesn't have to always be the ritual of everyone sitting at the table together or everyone coming together. It can be a ritual of carving pumpkins around Thanksgiving. It can be a ritual. Our family has done volunteer service on Christmas. It can be a ritual of cooking something really special together. Rituals are important for kids to mark time, like every year we do this, but there's no need for it to have to include people who you don't want to be with. Mm -hmm. Often with toxic family members, or I should say sometimes with toxic family members, our children can actually get along with them in a different way than we can. Maybe they don't have the same history. Maybe you've seen that. I've certainly seen that with my family and my children and their grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so you can encourage them to still have a relationship with their grandparents, for example, but not take them there for Thanksgiving. See, I think this is the problem. We associate relationship with the holidays. And they're actually not related at all. But I think that's what consumerism has done. If you have a good relationship, then you spend time on the holidays. Or if you spend time on the holidays, that means you have a good relationship. Mm -hmm. Those two things do not have to be equal. Mm -hmm. So maybe your kids spend time with these family members, but A, maybe when you're not there, B, maybe not at the most stressful time for your family member who might be preparing the meal or gathering everyone, like maybe you start thinking about what would be best for the kids and what would be best for whoever they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's artificial, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Now I know that this, in my personal experience, this relates to when you have a divorce household and the, uh, the possibility that, you know, one parent places a higher, you know, level of, you know, importance to holidays than maybe the other one does. For example, I'm, I'm really pretty flexible. As you've already yeah. seen, it's like whatever. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, I can imagine some families where, you know, you've only got, you know, your kids and you've got one Christmas day and how you end up trying to divide the holiday which I have found in, you know, in my experience with my own kids, it's not good for the kids. It's more or less the parents' power struggle. And again, the level of importance on it. But my kids have said to me, like, dude, we are the best holidays for us are when we just wake up in bed, you know, come downstairs in our pajamas and do nothing and just stay in one place. But families tend to drag, you know, the kids around to go right. visit everybody to make sure everyone gets their piece of that Christmas day pie or Hanukkah or whatever, you know, right. um, religious thing that you're dealing with. So you know, how do we, how do we change that a little bit? So again, it's, yeah. we're accommodating, but yet, um, you know, we're yeah. also not getting baited into this, you know, road trip for 24 right. hours. Well, what's so frustrating about that situation, I mean, is that, you know, the idea is that it's all for the kids, you know, that this is a kid's holiday, but really we're not seeing it from a kid's perspective. I mean, I, ideally what your kids mentioned, that would be the ideal situation. They stay in their house all day long. And maybe us grownups keep circling in and out, right? <laughs> right. Like they get to chill and play with their toys and relax and be present. And we're the ones who can be schlepping around. Um, so that's one idea for some families. Um, I also think that there's a really important message that you're sending when you're taking, trying to kind of, I guess, fill up all the holes, all the, of the dam when you are going everywhere around. I think the message you're sending the kids is that somebody, one of the parents, most likely, will be deeply disappointed if you don't see them. Mm -hmm. And that's too much pressure and too much power for a kid. Mm -hmm. Like every time my kids would go with my ex-husband and they'd say, oh, mom, what are you going to do? Are they, don't worry about me. You guys have a great time. I've got lots of stuff going on. Like the last thing your kids want to do, which they just naturally do, the last thing you want them to do is to worry about you. Mm -hmm. So if you're kind of grabbing for them on the holidays, you're sending the message that you're insecure and you're uncomfortable and that it's, you're, that you're having a hard time and that's going to lead to them having distress. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, the other thing that I can see that happens too is, um, that there's always, you know, again, always, we, we just, we're condemning everybody out there. <laughs> The holidays do it to us. Everybody. Like, ah. <laughs> yeah. um, but there, there can be, <laughs> you know, a, like the grandparents that are like, well, we've always had dinner at our place. You all have to come there. And I've, I've ran into that before where it's kind of like, yeah, but you know what, it, what is it doing to me? What is it doing to the, you know, to the kids to, to pack up and, you know, go someplace instead of having everybody come to you. I, mean, I, I agree with you. I think that's the ideal situation yeah. is that you can have your holiday in your home. And if anybody wants to come and visit you, that they can do that rather than again, you know, and it was a frustrating thing for me of like, do you know how expensive it is for me to pack my family up and fly them someplace yes. when it's cheaper for you to fly over to me? But people like draw like lines in the ground, right. you know, those things well, like, no, it's going to be this way, you know? Yeah. I think you're right. And I think as I think I also myself, and I think we have to own this, I have to own the fact that because of my discomfort with the, some of the toxic people in my family, I do withdraw. So I put myself sometimes in a passive position. So recently I actually said, why don't we host Thanksgiving? Which is a totally different experience for me because I can do whatever I want. It's like, it's so exciting. But in the past I haven't even considered it because I've been kind of victim-y. So I think part of it is like stepping out and really trusting that you can say, I wanna do this, I wanna do this my way. And if they say, we've always done this for years, you could say, I'm really sorry you're not going to be able to come. We would have loved to have had you. Nice. Yeah. Just right. But I think there's something like we're still in kind of like the deprivation fear state, understandably, when we have those kinds of toxic people in our family, that we don't necessarily rise to our best self and take care of ourselves and say, I'm going to do it here. Please come. Mm-hmm. 
Well, because I mean, camps form, you know, I've talked about this in a variety of things. We talked about camps forming and divorce, you know, yes. if, if somebody decides to, you know, buck the system, change the ritual and do something different, well then, you know, there's either going to be people that are supportive, but there's, there's also going to be people that don't support it and then wonder why you're trying to be difficult, right. you know, and so it doesn't come without a consequences, which is why we're talking about toxic families <laughs> <laughs> because that happens exactly. um, more often. Exactly. But I also got to, I also got to say, I think that a lot of, you know, air quote, normal families tend to get a little bit more toxic around the holidays, right? 100%. And if you could look into all those, you know, houses that you see with the smoke coming up and the beautiful wreaths out front, there's struggle and problems in every family. Like this is not, you know, this is not simply for toxic, for toxic families. I think in, when you have a toxic family relationship, you really have to think about what you need because you could really be very, very vulnerable, but all families get kind of frazzled and um, kind of lose sight in my perspective of what's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, if we go back to the divorce family that's got two kids and, you know, or kids and, you know, two parents that both, you know, feel pretty strongly about the day of, you know, whatever significance it might be, we'll call it Christmas. That's an easy yeah. one that, um, culturally for people to, to get their brain around because there's so much tradition with waking up and Santa Claus and, and all that other stuff, you yeah. know, uh, right now in the divorce system, it's you trade every other, you know, every other year is how everybody, you know, gets uh, their, I guess their fair share of all of that. How do you, when you have small kids address then when it's not your year with them and they are concerned about you? I know I've seen my kids do this too. They're, they're really concerned before they leave. Well, what mom, what are you going to do? And I, you know, I tell them I'm going to be fine. Everything's going to, but they know that, you know, there is no other family for me. So I'm going to be sitting home yeah. alone. They just have no idea how much I really like Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, when they get older, they'll realize. When yeah. Well, they're teenagers now. They're there. But, um, yeah. but how would you? How would you help make sure that your kids, as they do leave and they go into, and for example, they might go into a household that you're not really stoked about. You know. Yeah. Well, but more so, they might go into a house where people are talking crap about you. I mean. Yes. Yes. I mean, this is right. So with with the, first of all, early work to do is plan a gorgeous, wonderful day for yourself. You know, this, I, if divorced parents could see the days that they aren't with their kids as a day to their self versus a day they don't have their kids, it's a huge mindset shift. Mm -hmm. It's abundance versus scarcity, right? So when we think that we don't have our kids, it's scarcity, it's deprivation, it's fear. They're, they're not going to come back. They're coming back. And then you'll be like, wow, I wish I had appreciated my time. <laughs> if we think about it as abundant, right? As, oh my gosh, what can I do today? It's, it's a day off. I'm not going to be getting any emails. It's so quiet. What am I going to binge or where am I going to go and explore where it's not going to be crowded because nobody's going to be there? Like really thinking of it as a gift for yourself, that will emanate onto your kids. And then you can tell them, I'm so, actually so excited that you're with dad because I get to go to the observatory today without any crowds and I get to walk around and go for a hike and it's going to be really nice. And then I can't wait to see you when you get back. So I think that you have to start with really taking care of yourself and figuring out what will really light you up and then sharing it with them. And, and they, won't, they won't think twice of it because they really just want to hear and feel that you feel good about what you're doing that day. Mm -hmm. That's good. I, that's good advice. I like that. Yeah. Now, uh, before we, we transition to another topic here on the kid thing, you know, I think the other thing that we also experience through the holidays when we mix our families all together is the behaviors of certain family members with our children that we're not really excited about. Maybe uh -huh. it's uh, too much spoiling or maybe it's just the way they talk to them or you know, somebody decides they're going to be the disciplinarian because the kids are all running around the house with their cousins having fun and stuff like that. You know, yeah. what kind of, what kind of advice do you have for people when they, when they're walking into that dynamic again with all these nervous systems and, you know, how they want their own children to be treated and talked to is yeah. now being just violated by, you know, five or six yeah. people in the room. Yep. Yeah. So I always say the nervous system loves to be prepared. So really think, and this is hard because who wants to talk today about like how shitty something's going to be in a few weeks? You just kind of like push that off. You're like, we'll just deal with that. Understandably. Mm -hmm. You really want to think about the, the potential, you can't control everything, but the potential areas where there might be um, a tendency for a little bit of 
a flare up. So I'll give you an example from some of my clients. Um, one who had a parent who was pretty severely eating disordered and was always commenting on how she looked and then would comment on her, how her daughter looked and would also not have food in the house. So one of the things we talked about was coming with a cooler full of food, the things that they like to do, things that they like to eat, um, and so that she knew there was going to be food. So she didn't have to go through this, do I get food? Do I ask my mom to shop? You know, she kind of took care of herself in that way. And then she decided, we decided, we came up with a few lines that when she heard her mom say something about her daughter's body or her own body would say, mom, in our family, we don't comment on people's outsides, only on their insides. Pretty succinct, pretty clear, right? Yeah, so she, yeah. Kind of knew, she knew what she could. You know, a lot of us, if we think, we know the things that are going to come up. Mm -hmm. um, so th that part of it is preparing. Mm -hmm. um, preparing, and this, is, this goes back to, like, not staying there. Preparing, knowing that, like, even though all the kids are staying up till midnight, you're going to take your kid home at nine to stay on the routine. Um, and then to also know that you're some things you're not going to have control over. Like, they will definitely have more sugar than you would like. Okay. They're definitely going to hear more cursing potentially than they would hear. Or that, for, for example, I was right? Say, not in my house. Right? Maybe not in my house. <laughs> less cursing. We do. Maybe less cursing in New York City. But um, yeah. So so you want to think about about the things you're also just going to be able to have to let go of. And remember, this is one day out of 364 days. Mm -hmm. So this is not going to retrain or undo or screw up what you've been doing with your kids for 364 days for however many years that they're been alive. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. to, so to plan as much as you can, let go when you can, you know, they say let go or be dragged and put your hand on your heart and remember like, it's just one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> Take deep, <laughs> lots of deep breaths and lots of these, right? Exactly. Yeah. So the other, um, the other kind of big minefield when it comes to the holidays yeah. uh, is actually religion. Um, because, you know, first of all, the origin of many of these holidays are religious in nature. Um, yeah. And they, uh, you know, I always remember it being like such a big deal because of the religious factor, even mm -hmm. though, again, you know, nobody went to church the rest of the year. <laughs> And that's when I started to reject a lot of that. It was just kind of like, I, that didn't make any sense to me. Um, but let's say you're coming in and you've got like mixed faith families, you yeah. know, uh, you know, and that, that does happen for some families where, you know, Jewish Christian, you know, uh, people getting together and having to accommodate one another. And some people just ha are so close minded, they can't do that. Yes. Um, you know, so how do we, how do we tiptoe around some of these things? If, you know, your Jewish boyfriend's coming with you to Christmas dinner and your parents all want to talk about that. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't like tiptoeing. <laughs> we don't tiptoe. <laughs> we're direct and we're clear. Yeah. And we say, you know, I, I, I'd like to come for Christmas um, and my boyfriend will be coming with me. And if there's any intolerance of who he is, we're not going to stay. You know, being really clear or you have your faith and I have my faith. You know, I think the, the, the problem that comes up and this kind of coming up in the world is that we try to defend our side and show our side without always acknowledging the other person's need, I think, for closeness. So sure, maybe they're trying to convert your Jewish boyfriend, but probably they just want to, you to say, like, I know how much Christianity has helped you in your life. And I know how important it is to you. I've made different choices. As opposed to, at least in my experience, I would say like, well, I don't care about this and why, you know, I don't care about that religion. And I, I'm Jewish and have um, been married twice to both to non-Jewish people. And um, I found that once I acknowledged specifically my father's deep faith, that it was really important to him and that my being with somebody not Jewish was very difficult for him because of his faith. But I wasn't going to change anything. I could just feel the energy kind of lessen. Mm -hmm. You know, this fear of like, oh my gosh, you're leaving. I'm losing you. To, the religion's losing you. And just saying, no, no, you still have me, right? You're connecting. So you're saying like, you still have me, even if I'm not religious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, and that can also lend into the other thing that can end up happening is the yeah. uh, choices to go to church or worship, you yeah. know, during uh, during the, this time of period. And for somebody that may be agnostic or even atheist and, yeah. and wanting to not do it, and then the swirl of hostility that can actually erupt around, you know, choosing to not do something again that you don't do throughout the rest of the year. And even, right. even they might not even do it as often, but again, there's this whole symbology that's really around it and um, right. that can be really powerful. So I, you know, how, yeah, do, we, how again, do we bow out? <laughs> again, like, I just want to call that out as being complete bullshit. I mean, I wouldn't suggest this, but the first thing that comes to mind is like, you know, it's not like you would say, Hey, like I go to the strip club every Saturday. Like, will you come to a strip club with me? Right? Like, just because it's church and you do that every, like, I don't know. We all do different things mm -hmm. and that's not my thing. So I find that in fact, like pretty infuriating because it just feels really, um, controlling. And I wonder if instead, similarly thinking as, as a therapist, like instead of saying, I don't go to church or I'm an atheist, I don't believe in it, just saying, you know, that's just not something that I, that I do. I'll be here at home looking forward to seeing you when you get back. Mm -hmm. Just really setting a very clear boundary that there's no, there's no wiggle room. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. just, it's just like I'm, I, I do or I don't, you know, feel comfortable going to strip, but like, I'm just not going. Like, that's why I bring that up because it's like, <laughs> Either you're going to say, you know, like you, if someone said, hey, we're going to, like, everyone have a very clear answer. I do or I don't. Like, why isn't it the same with church? <laughs> you're the first person that I think has used this, this <laughs> an analogy of strip clubs and church. <laughs> right, exactly. Maybe, maybe but you're right. It's, it, it's that clear, right? It, it's yes. really that clear. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Right. And just because it's, it's Christmas, like, what does that mean? I don't do this. I don't do this on my regular my regular life. And if you feel like you can be a little more comfortable with somebody, you say, you know, I don't do this in my regular life and I'm trying to just be consistent with how I am with the rest of my, my year. Yeah. Yeah. And it can get twisted in with the kids again too, because this yeah. is another part where the kids can actually add some complexities because then again, there's that added guilt, you know, of, well, you're not taking yeah. your kids to church, you know, you're just like, well, no, I guess I'm not, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Right. And part of what is coming out on me also, I'm noticing is that, you know, we don't really want to see this toxicity, right? We, the rest of the year, not we can hide from it, but we can kind of push it away. And in the holidays, it really comes up. And so when you have a toxic family, there is no way every holiday is going to be the same. Maybe you will start realizing over time that you can't be part of it, or then maybe you'll try one year and then you won't. Like I want, I want to allow people to, to know that they can be, that it's a move. It's moving. It's a moving part. There is no right way. And you can try to figure out what feels right that year, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, one thing that I've experienced and, you know, it's hard for me to, to say this out loud and, and kind of admit to this, but, you know, the other thing that I've always had problems with the holidays for me was to, to get phone calls from people that you don't talk to you know, at all during the course of the year and throwing out that really powerful world of love you know, we love you. We miss you. We, you know, whatever. And I, I always sit there and think to myself, we don't even know each other anymore, <laughs> you know? Um, but that whole, don't you love us mentality really kind of, you know, is a, uh, you know, gets woven into that and really does, you know, mind fuck you. I mean, I know that's yeah. a colorful term, but that's how that feels. And I, you know, I even got to the point of not accepting phone calls on the holidays, you know, just because it was like, I, I don't, you know, here's 360 plus days that I've had a lot of really good days and I've had a lot of really crappy days, but I've had none, none of, none of you involved in any of them. Yes. Um, and now you want me to tell me, you know, or want me to tell you all that I love and miss you when I don't actually feel that way right now, you know, in yeah. my life. Yeah. Um, and that makes that really hard. Like I said, it's a tough thing to admit that I don't know that other people would admit that, but it just, it, you know, it, it I, like I said, at times it's made my skin crawl at having to force that through that holiday period that I just, like I said, I, I shut it down. Like I just, you know, would rather treat it as, you know, just other days and other times. And I don't assign all that to it because it feels false, you know? Right. Well, you're shutting, one way of looking at it is you're shutting it down. The other way is that you're being totally true and authentic and real. And most, many people aren't there yet. We can pray that they will be there one day. 
um, but they're not there. So you are, you are calling out something that is real and that's always going to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And you're right. It, many people say, I love you. We miss you. And they don't really understand what the kind of love you need. Right. So they might feel like they love you. They are, have fondness of you or, and it's, you don't, and it doesn't land. And that's, that's okay. No shame there. I mean, I think, I think that's really courageous of you to basically say the truth. And people don't not always like that, but you're saying like, please don't, don't just dial this in for me. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, it, it, I know that it's, it's hard for me to say that just now. And I can imagine that's a, a lot how other people really feel, which I think that was why it was important to share that is because, mm -hmm. you know, we do get pulled places that we really don't want to go. And that's just been symptomatic of our whole life. And at some point you just have to say enough is enough, you know, and, and sometimes the holidays end up being that catalyst to finally be able to look yourself mm -hmm. and go, like you said, at the beginning of the interview, what is it that I really want? What do I really want from this? Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't have to be um, constantly drug into something that just, you know, erodes at my well being on a, you know, even right. if it's only four days out of the year, you know, for yeah. many reasons. Yeah. And not to analyze you, but even the way you talked about <laughs> deciding not to, um, answer those calls, there was still this shame around it that somehow, I don't know if you used the word cutting off, that somehow there was something aggressive on your part, that it was hurting other people as opposed to it being deeply protective. Yeah, no, you're right. No, you're right? absolutely right. It be, and it's because I think that it doesn't feel okay for everybody else to be okay with that. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, totally. You know, and when we're recovering from codependency, that's what we are struck with, which is like, this is going to make that other person uncomfortable. But honestly, the next day, if you had taken all those calls, I promise you the next day, something terrible would have happened to you emotionally mm -hmm. because you would have had to pretend, you know, cause you can't, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we think, oh, that won't take too long just to answer the phone and say, thanks for calling. But something, at least for me, I know my nervous system, when I'm not in, when I'm not in alignment with the truth, it eats away at me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really so does. Self-protection. It's really self-protection. Yeah. Well, so this kind of then brings us into, you know, we can get really worn out by these experiences. If, you know, if we, we do walk into them, and even in my case, even if I choose not to be in them, they can still come find us, right? Yes, um, awesome. yes. Yeah. And so what do you, what are some good ways for that recovery so that we don't end up being, you know, kind of shocked into, you know, some negative feelings yeah. and, and body and everything like that post yeah. holidays. Yeah. So the first thing I would really recommend is once you leave the, the place, write down next year, I will, and write yourself a letter. <laughs> next year, no way I'll come here, right? And then look at it in a few months when you're trying to make your decision. Like, please, like after the moment, because we, we forget, we just, that's how the, our brain works. So that's the first thing. Really, really journal. I mean, I would encourage you to journal and write while you're on the trip with your toxic family, no matter what, just so that you can ground and feel connected to your thoughts, know what's going on, process things, um, but certainly after. So that's the first thing. Um, I would recommend if you have the luxury of taking a day off after you get back to do that to think about what really nourishes you and really nourishes your soul. It might be spending time with your, you know, having a friend's giving, right? Having, being with your friends who are chosen family. It might be taking a long bike ride or a walk. It might be taking a bath. It might be cleaning your house if that's what makes you feel nourished. So really taking some time for you and really time, because I think as I, that um, example of the one hour, two hour, three hour, you know, one hour where the toxic family has huge reverberations. There's often people that I don't need to take the whole day off. Maybe I'll just go in a little late. No, I'm telling you, we probably need a week, right? So like take, take the time. Um, talk to trusted people who get it. Share your experience. Um, and this is something that I think is so deeply important when you're writing what you want to do next year and how different you want it to be, see if you can move these feelings through your body 
See if you can go to, for me, it would be like to go to a dance class or even just if it was so sad to play sad music and just let yourself cry. You know, you know, you know a lot about this too, but like not only bringing in the cognitive piece, but also bringing in the body because your body most likely has been in fight, flight or freeze for the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, something struck me too, which was um, for the people that choose to then not do this with their family, but yet have this sense of loneliness at, you know, and that there, there is a grief for that. You know, I will admit to that, you know, the, the first time you don't do it, you decide that you're, you're not, you're, you're dealing like, I I can't go this way. It's not like it happens and you're just like, oh my God, this is amazing. Why didn't I do this sooner? There is a grieving moment because you are grieving the loss of some rituals from childhood. You are grieving those days as a kid that you remember these to be really great experiences. And as an adult, they're not there. So for people that might be going into this holiday, and let's just say this is going to be the first one that they're deciding for themselves, Mm -hmm. that they just can't do it any longer. What, what would they do differently this first go around so that they, um, I don't want to call it backsliding, but they, they, they feel and trust that choice, you know, to do it differently this year for themselves. It's a really great question. And I love the fact that you brought up this idea of really recognizing the loss. So I would say kind of going into it with a very open heart and curiosity, maybe a curiosity of how the time is going to go versus an idea that it has to go a certain way. And what just keeps, what pops into my mind when you say this also is thinking about what your future self, who's done this for three, four, five, ten years, would turn back and say to you, like, girl, you're, this is going to be so good. Today is hard as hell. I know it, but I'm so much more free, whatever it might be. But just thinking about kind of getting wisdom from the future, that this is the, these are the, these are those hard, those first few days of doing this. That's really hard. It's the hardest, I guess, that it'll ever be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that wisdom from the future. That's actually, that's amazing. Um, yeah. You know, seeing that it's more than just the moment that you're in right now and yes. kind of living through it, but understanding that that's why you're choosing to do that is because it will keep getting better for you, you know, as you keep moving forward. So that's great. Yes. Cool. Well, I'm glad I asked that question because like yes. I said, it just kind of came up that it's not always as easy as just saying yes and no. Life isn't black and white, you know? No, yeah. No. And that there's going to be loss. And I promise you, if you, if you are vulnerable and open with people who you feel comfortable, you are not alone. There are so many of us who have this experience more than you think. And you might get beautiful ideas from them about how they celebrate their holidays and the experiences that they've been through. You know, that when we grow up in toxic families, often we've had to survive by being so singularly focused for survival in the sense of like, how do we get ourselves through like managing everybody, but we we don't really ask for help because it was too dangerous. Mm -hmm. But there's so much wisdom out there. Well, and I'm hoping that anybody that's feeling that can get that from this conversation that you and I just had, the wisdom that you've been able to share with us and stuff. So I appreciate that. Yes. Well, I think we did a good thing today here, Elizabeth, and I, I'm so happy that you took the time to talk to me again. I, I, you know, I've mentioned this before, this whole path that I've been on in the last year of doing this show has just, uh, not only have I grown personally from this, it feels unfair, to be honest with you. I feel unfair that I get to do this, um, but, it, but really it's been heartwarming and it's been uh, just amazing that people do, uh, do get help from this and listening to this. And so for you to be able to take time again to sit down with me and to be able to have this conversation is, um, I'm truly grateful. And so thank you so much for that. Oh, and thank you for, you know, shedding the light on pain in such a smart and informative way so that we can understand how to move through it. 